The spring anime season is pretty much wrapped up at this point. It's about time to take it out back and bury it like the rest. If you're new to this channel, welcome. This is the bookend to my season preview I did back in April. Now this isn't a comprehensive list of what was out this season, just the shows I stuck with and my thoughts on how they shaped up. And if you enjoy that sort of content, why not hit the subscribe button and stay up to date on seasonal anime content from me. Alright, let's get into it. I like to start off on a high note, and that means the shows I consider good. There was quite the spread this season, from action, fantasy, romance, and even a few surprises that kept me guessing. And just looking at the sheer number we got, it seems like we had a pretty decent season overall. So, these are the shows I would outright recommend you to watch. I doubt there was any surprise that Spice and Wolf would end up here. It's a remake of an incredibly popular anime and light novel series that holds a place in many fans' hearts. And I was going into this fresh, as I hadn't watched the original Spice and Wolf, because I was too busy watching Brain Rot at the time apparently. So how does this stack up to the high expectations placed upon it? Nicely, if you're looking for something that's a return to form for fantasy anime. In the current landscape, Spice and Wolf is exactly what I've been wanting. An actual fantasy series that isn't focused on isekai or an OP protagonist slinging magic around left and right. It's incredibly character driven as it follows the journey of the two leads, exploring bits of the culture and world along the way. I found the experience organic and incredibly immersive, as the conflicts that arose wrap the characters up in them, and generally expand on their relationship in some aspect as a result. While the animation isn't the flashiest this season, it certainly knew what it wanted to accomplish by capturing the pristine beauty of a medieval fantasy world, creating a captivating atmosphere to frame the story against. I was pleased with this, and definitely a solid jumping on point for those looking to start this franchise. In another case of zero surprises, Windbreaker comes across as an entirely brainless show if you're looking at it purely on paper. A series about a kid who wants to prove himself, so he goes to a school known for fighting to kick ass and become the boss of the place, but quickly subverts that notion by giving a lot of meaning to these archetypes. Sakura is a kid who's dealing with a lot of trauma and lashing out, but certainly not a bad person. He has strong principles, but a hard time connecting and communicating with others. So when he finds himself essentially in a school-sanctioned gang that does community service and protection work, he learns the true meaning of friendship and somewhat healthy relationships. And this series doesn't shy away from the blatant violence its premise entails, as the fighting isn't just brutal, but tells the story of these characters. There's an incredible understanding of not just what makes a fight look cool, but a subtlety in how it uses action as a substitute for a conversation between conflicting ideologies. Cloverworks does an amazing job executing that. Amazingly kinetic action reinforced by beautiful art and interesting cinematography made this an absolutely unforgettable experience. Windbreaker elevates the delinquent fighting genre beyond the gratuitous violence with a strong personal story that's character driven where the violence is the language of the story, and I'm incredibly impressed. If you haven't watched Windbreaker, definitely correct that mistake. Oh boy, talking about multiple seasons of a show gets pretty damn tedious. Because in the first, I've pretty much said all I really have to, and by the second, it set the pace for whether it's one to keep up with in the first place. But here I am again, trying to recommend that time I got reincarnated as a slime for a third time. Great news, the season starts off by hitting the ground running from the last. Yeah, it seems like they've learned from their mistakes and picked up the pace on what really draws the audience in. But other than that, it's just more slime. If you're somehow not interested in one of the more comfortable and prevalent isekai franchises out currently, I don't know what I could really say to convince you at this point. Besides, it's got a solid mix of comedy, action, and self-awareness which creates a fun watch, especially for an isekai. I think the biggest upset this season was Girls Band Crime. This anime is so much better than it has any right to be. Ostensibly, this is just a cash grab to promote a real band the producers are trying to launch through the anime. But that sure as shit didn't stop the writers from creating a compelling series to drive those sales. We're dealing with a group of girls, all with their own emotional damage, but they're not drowning in sadness, they're straight up vengeful. And each packs a ton of personality that stands in direct contrast to most anime character tropes. But what impressed me the most was how likable the cast was, despite the fact they're designed to be pretty damn unlikable in the first place. Nina is a combative, emotionally confused girl who's either biting somebody's head off or moping around in most scenes. But she's also the heart of the band and the franchise by bringing so much raw emotion into the music and uniting her fellow members when it matters most. The majority of music anime these days just seems to be about people either in a band or in an idol group. 
so I was pleased to see just how much of this is actually about the band coming together, playing, and growing as an underground entity, which works as a unifying plot to keep the otherwise mismatched cast together. Overall, I enjoyed the strong characters in this anime, but probably the most surprising element is the fact that this is an entirely 3D anime. Yeah, who would have thought that not only did I like a 3D anime enough to give it a recommendation, at least one not made by Orange, but that I'm confident in saying the 3D style works well for the production here, mostly because it was envisioned as a 3D work originally. It utilizes the strengths of a 3D environment in a way that most other anime don't, with strong camera work and more animation, while also going above and beyond to increase the expressiveness of the models. This series is a literal breath of fresh air in the anime music genre, because it's so unlike most others on the market. Definitely take a look. Wow, two girls band anime in the same season and I was in love with them both? Absolutely insane. Yeah, Jellyfish Can't Swim in the Night was another absolute powerhouse this season. While a bit more on the traditional side, the characters still meshed well in an authentic way. Like, I buy that these people are really friends. On top of that, there's a lot of nuance to the drama involved in this anime that otherwise takes pretty standard struggles and elevates them in a narrative sense while also keeping them relatable. There's a major emphasis on self-identity in this series and who we choose to be, but more importantly, it's liking who you are as a result of those choices. The characters aren't called to make an internet sensation anonymous band project mixing music, art, and social media marketing. They chose to do that because that's their form of self-expression, an exploration into who they want to be. Learning to love the art you were once embarrassed by, regaining confidence to not filter yourself, and even the courage to overcome your parents' shadow. There's a lot that thematically works in this anime as the cast navigates their lives while trying to discover themselves. And that's not really a new concept, but it's done extremely well in this series. And matching that energy was Dogo Kobo's incredible animation. Artistically detailed, but grounded in its presentation to make the cast come alive. If you were sleeping on this upbeat drama series, definitely give it a look. Now, I was kind of torn on where to stick Go Go Loser Ranger this season. While this series isn't thematically as strong as it could be, I did find the story to be incredibly engaging. The idea of a Sentai Force actually being sort of bad isn't new, but I think what makes this one stand out is not just that the Sentai Force is bad, but it's a systemic sort of evil. While there are good actors in it who want to change it for the better, the main driving forces here aren't good. The lead is a literal monster out to destroy the world, and the rangers are using their power to manipulate public perception for profit and influence. So yeah, there's a lot of nuances in how such a system would work in a modern world. Where resources are diverted away from police for these rangers, people have grown complacent with a literal evil fortress overhead, and the monsters are backed into a corner creating a situation where the slightest spark could upend the whole system in general. And that's where we're at with this series picking up. You're definitely on the edge of your seat each week with some new twist keeping you coming back. On top of that, there's solid animation that's not just nice looking, but pretty technically impressive as it goes above and beyond to be as flashy as possible. Overall, a surprising action series that delves into some pretty heavy topics, while not sugarcoating the horrible crap this world unwittingly created. So definitely worth a look, especially if you're into Sentai. I don't know if there's a season out there in which I'm not recommending Mushoku Tensei highly, but if we're comparing it to Last Core, the second half of the season is a massive improvement. Seeing both a ton of mental growth in Rudy, his relationships, and a strong emotional connection with his family that really hits home how well-rounded of a person he's become. And I won't lie, seeing him confront his old self by proxy and what his previous family went through in his old life, while also managing to sympathize with the sister he's had a rough relationship with, really made this feel like a full circle sort of experience. More so than overcoming his fear of leaving the house in season 1, and way more than fixing his ED in the first core this season. Ultimately, Mushoku Tensei is a roller coaster between liking Rudy and hating his guts. I think that's what makes it such a fascinating series to revisit, because it's so much more complex than good guy reincarnates into a fantasy world to overthrow evil, like so many other isekais are. This one is, through and through, about second chances in healing, which isn't always a straightforward experience. So with that, we made it to the middle of the pack. While the last section were shows I would unconditionally recommend to check out, these ones had something or another holding them back, either animation, writing quality, or pacing. But these are still enjoyable series to watch, just not as highly recommended. So let's get on into them. 
I really thought I would end up hating Remonster, especially since it's such a budget version of Tensura, even though it came before it. But despite it being an isekai that just hasn't really aged well, it still wasn't the worst thing in the world. My biggest issues with this anime were how haphazard it felt with elements being thrown at the audience, almost zero world building, and the fact that what few aspects of its setting are unique get overshadowed entirely by how blatantly power trippy this is. There's no sense of scale or achievement for what happens or who most of the adversaries are, and the vast majority just fade into the background from their very introduction that I barely even remember who they are or how they even entered the story. That goes for the main cast too, by the way. Further, that's not really helped by their ever-changing appearances due to evolution, and constant name changes on top of that. Because, you know, fuck consistency, am I right? That, quite fittingly, left this series lacking in identity, despite the makings for something that could have been somewhat intriguing. The fact that the game elements sort of play into an actual in-universe narrative for the people once they reach a certain level of power is a neat idea, but that's barely elaborated on and doesn't really manifest until near the end of the season. Mixed with a fairly bland look for the series made for an overall forgettable experience that might get brought up in an isekai binge years down the line. So yeah, that was a lot of ways of saying this doesn't really stand out, but otherwise is a pretty passable isekai. I might actually catch some flack for sticking I was reincarnated as the seventh prince down here, but this series is incredibly polarizing, so I'm splitting the difference. In terms of plot, it's pretty bad from an objective standpoint, as there's really nothing happening besides some one-off adventures that loosely tie together, but on a lizard brain level, it has some pretty good action scenes and hype. There are some moments where the comedy shines, but the majority of the jokes are as predictable as dude does an impossible thing with ease because he's the main character. Then there's the animation that swings from really nice during the action scenes to what the actual fuck am I looking at? Yeah, it's almost like the staff had split personalities or something. And I don't know, maybe this is just a personal gripe, but why did it feel like they were trying to make the young male lead sexy? The skimpy outfits, poses, expressions, and how he ends up half naked way too often by mistake? Yeah, that made me somewhat uncomfortable while watching. If I were to look at it for what it actually is, it's a pretty dumb OP protag anime that isn't really trying to do much more than that. It does have a decent grasp on what makes those stories work and packs in some decent humor to keep you interested, but that genre is so oversaturated by this point that it's not really unique enough to stand on its own merits. If you're looking for an OP protag anime to burn away the afternoon, you could do worse than this. So there's that. You know, I really wanted to like the Bartender remake more than I did, because on paper, this series had a lot to like on a personal level, because I'm a borderline alcoholic. But what we got was less cool lounge bar vibes, and more vaguely dramatic slice of life that's mostly too informative about whatever interest the author hyperfixated on while writing this series. I just can't imagine that most bartenders walk around in their everyday lives dropping the deep lore on random cocktails for their patrons and each other, at least on a regular basis, like, what? But maybe that's just me. That said, what we got wasn't really bad by any stretch, but it certainly won't hold the average viewer's attention for long. The pace is meandering, the payoff isn't really worth it, and what I ended up watching this for was sadly the very thing I just called it out for a few lines back. Cocktail porn and the character relationships. In that regard, it works well as a slice of life. But I think I might have actually enjoyed it more if it just dropped the pretenses of a plot and committed to that instead. If you're looking for a slice of life anime that's not the typical high school or rom-com variety, this certainly is worth a look. A condition called love just didn't land for me like it probably should have. And I'm not blaming the series itself entirely. We've been blessed with some really strong romance anime over the past few years. One that's just decent feels lackluster in comparison due to recency bias. But nonetheless, I wasn't really impressed. The characters were the weakest aspect. While the actual romance dynamic works and has enough legs to propel the plot forward, hell, I'm really grateful this series avoided the typical love triangle trope for as long as it did, letting the main point of the series breathe. But that doesn't really excuse the fact that the main girl has no personality and how obsessive the main dude is. Do these aspects stem from their respective childhood dramas? Sure, but that doesn't make her any more entertaining to watch in the meantime, nor really excuse his gross behavior. I mean, in his case, it's actually a character flaw that he works to overcome, so props there. This isn't helped by the utterly generic-looking shoujo manga aesthetic the series employs that fades into the background. Romance usually needs detailed animation and art to hit the audience with the big moments that sell the series. 
but I didn't really get that here, even though there were points it was definitely trying to. Now, it wasn't bad, in fact, it was entirely consistent, which is why this isn't a mark against the series, but it's something it could have done better on. That said, there are still moments that do sell the romance in this anime, the character's actual love confession, both of their birthdays, and their first kiss. So don't be mistaken that me not liking the characters means this series was bad. If you're desperate for a romance anime this season, this is your fix, because it was the best showing the genre got. Wow, I'm really sticking an Archdemon's Dilemma down here, huh? Yeah, I'm not sorry. This series is very confused on what it wants to be, and while it does both sides decently well, it gives a serious case of whiplash. In an anime with slavery, human sacrifice, and demon summoning, you also get cutesy grade school levels of flirting and adopted daughter family fan service. And that mostly comes across as what story or plot the anime has going on at the time is put on hold for entire scenes or just straight up episodes for fluff. And with how dark the subject matter is, it feels like a different show at times entirely. But at the same time, the fluff isn't exactly unwelcomed. I like seeing Nephi and Zagon's flirting and seeing their relationship with Valifor is heartwarming. And unfortunately, this is an episode or two away from Zagon's supposed best friend betraying him, trying to kill his slave elf bride, blaming a string of human sacrifices on him. In the very next episode, all is forgiven by the core cast because why not? Even Dude is in disbelief over that one. I had a hard time parsing what this show wanted to take seriously and eventually just kind of gave up and assumed nothing, because what little stakes there are are just turned into gags when they're resolved. If you want a very silly take on the Demon Lord premise, this could satisfy that, and it certainly is entertaining once you come to terms with the fact that this isn't going to get serious or really go anywhere. Grandpa and Grandma Turn Young Again didn't really fit anywhere but this tier, to be honest. It's a slice-of-life comedy series with some unique ideas, but what little story there is doesn't really progress much. The age-changing shenanigans are there to set up feels and jokes, but that, no pun intended, gets old pretty quick if you're not vibing with that style of humor. But hey, if you are, you'll enjoy this series. And while the setup doesn't really seem to lend much in the way of joke fuel, it does at least try to vary it up somewhat. But this series, at the end of the day, does just boil down to the grandparents love each other, and age doesn't really matter to them. There's not a ton I can really say about this anime because it's so inconsequential in terms of execution that it's not really worth talking about unless you're a massive fan of Slice of Life, or I guess the web manga of this series. And the issue I had was, there's just more engaging Slice of Life out there than this, even in this season. It might surprise some that I'm sticking unnamed memory down in this tier, Here's the thing, on paper, this anime has a lot going for it. An interesting story, great leads, a fun romance dynamic, and honestly some really nice action to add variety. But the issue I found here was consistency. The first few episodes promised a lot that this didn't keep. Mostly it just lacks focus and faith in the story it's adapting. Usually I'm criticizing shows for being way too slow, but this was the opposite case. Going in, I was never really sure what I was going to get each week because the pace was breakneck as it sprinted past what seemingly could have been entire arcs worth of content in an episode or two. What really sold that idea was how the mage country and people working in the shadows had been built up in the background for the first half of the season, and that felt like it was going to be the main plot of this entire thing. However, uh, it's not. It's wrapped up in about three episodes after the halfway point, leaving the series to just keep meandering on after, constantly priming the audience for the next big plot point without properly paying off the one it's currently working on. The mystery of who Tinasha is and what's her connection to Oscar's family is undercut in a single scene, with the entire ensuing conflict having zero tension due to the obvious double cross and plot armor. And that inconsistency doesn't stop at the story as there's brief moments when the animation shows some real promise and then promptly falls flat on its face right after. My biggest issue is, is I wanted to like this anime, and there was a lot that I did like, but due to its poor pacing and swings in production quality, I was left disappointed because I saw what this could have been. If you're looking for a fantasy romance, this does fit the bill. Just don't get your hopes up too high. Of the two Yuri shows this season, the many sides of voice actor radio was the least Yuri. But if girls blushing at each other and tension is all it takes to get a girl's love tag these days, who am I to judge? Especially when the show manages to stand on its own merits besides that. Yeah, there's a few franchises out there that showcase how bad the entertainment industry is in Japan, 
And while this anime is about the anime industry, it doesn't have an overtly anime is awful to work in sort of message. The struggles of being a seiyu idol do come up, but really this is about professional growth and making friends in a job you love, which was a bit refreshing. I found the two leads to be different sorts of grading that grow on you as they warm up to one another, creating this very organic relationship between them and the audience. But hey, it can't be all praise. The actual plot does drag at times with here's a hurdle to overcome and bam, next episode we overcome it. That begins to feel a bit formulaic. And the closest this game from breaking from that was the fallout when the leads had to ditch their professional personas and be their true selves on air, kind of ruining their fans' immersion. I would have liked a lot more of that, but what we got was still a decent light drama series about living as a voice actor in Japan. If you're looking for an industry drama show, this might just be worth a look. I know I enjoyed what we actually got. I had higher expectations for Kaiju number 8 than what we actually got. For one of the more popular, newer generation shonen manga, I really expected this to knock audiences off their feet, like My Hero Academia and Demon Slayer did, but the problem is I can't really place why this didn't resonate with me. Perhaps it's because the action and plot were a bit slower paced than most other big franchises, or maybe it was just the lack of impact, despite how nice looking and great the action was or I could just be burnt out on the next big anime franchise hype. Either way, the end result is still a visually engaging anime with a fun plot that pulls you in, eventually. However, how long it takes to get answers or really move into its plot was pretty damn slow by shonen standards. I could have used more hooks instead of waiting until halfway through the first season to really drop the biggest hints on what the first arc's about. Despite kaiju being in the name here, these are more just monstrous creatures than traditional kaiju, as the ones you typically associate with the genre are few and far between. But it certainly packs an interesting mix of Cronenberg-style horror and shonen action that makes for an interesting package overall. A1 Pictures did a great job here, putting in some stellar animation that's flashy, but also technically impressive. Their detailed-oriented style brought the world this takes place into life. So if you're looking for a shonen action series this season, especially if you enjoy more mainstream stuff, Kaiju No. 8 is an easy pickup, because it's like most of the others on the market. So with that, we're moving into our lowest tier. These are the anime that have one or more major issues holding them back, and usually I couldn't even finish them because they're so bad. That might be because their animation was shit, their plot was slow and boring, or maybe it just looked at me funny. Either way, these are the ones I don't really recommend, so let's take a deeper look. Starting off the bottom of the barrel is the banished former hero lives as he pleases. I barely made it halfway through this series, which I think deserves some praise for making it that far, before I realized I had better uses for my time than watching another badly animated blatant power fantasy. I think listing what I liked about this series would be harder than just flat out listing its flaws, so let's just consider this not a comprehensive list, alright? The animation was abysmally bad, flat out unfinished in places, the character designs were somehow both over-designed and forgettable, don't ask me how that happens, because I could barely tell some of them apart. The plot was an incoherent mess that lacked focus, and none of these issues were getting addressed after a whopping six episodes. In that time, our dude randomly finds his previously unmentioned princess fiancé being attacked, saves her, joins them in saving a random village from a monstrous dragon with a different hero entirely, then visits a blacksmith that's being targeted by demons by pure coincidence, then thwarts an insurrection plot by his brother and father who are actually evil. And these events don't connect in the slightest. Like, there's some tissue paper thin excuses tying them together, but it really reeks of whatever scenario the author felt like maybe in the moment got into his final draft somehow by accident, and the editor scrambled to cover. This series is absolute garbage with zero value, because it's meant to just be an excuse to have an OP protagonist with some eye candy for viewers. So skip it, because there's plenty of better examples in the genre. I really tried to give High Speed 8 while a chance. Now, this series did have some potential, but you can tell the creators are more interested in racing video games than actually making an anime, because this looks like clips from a different show interspersed with random race scenes. I gave this series five episodes, and that was still too many. Not only had the plot failed to even drop hints of starting by that point, but I could barely pick the main character out of a crowd. She's meant to be a prodigy sort of racer, scouted because she could beat a world record in a video game. But when it's time for her to actually race, she's a bumbling klutz who barely knows what the buttons in her car even do. And those are the most glaring issues with this series. The plot falls apart on that alone. 
but then it never ties together any of the threads or gets to a point. So I'm left wondering what's keeping me watching. Turns out it was nothing. And here's my obligatory bashing on 3D anime spiel. This feels like some poorly rendered VTuber models slapped in an unreleased racing game for backdrops, because the characters and setting don't really fit together. Hell, the character designs clash to the point they don't even appear to be from the same series. And this reeks of all the issues I talked about Girls Band Cry avoiding, because the models aren't expressive, stiff, and while it uses the 3D environment well for the race scenes, the rest of the series fails to. It's probably not the worst racing series out there, but it's definitely not worth a look unless you're really desperate for a racing anime. I somehow managed to avoid really bad isekai this season, and I'm sure some would find it unfair that I'm rating as a reincarnated aristocrat, I'll use my appraisal skill to rise in the world so lowly, but I'm so sick of watching what amounts to the same exact series over and over again. Every civilization builder isekai is essentially the same. Pretty much just like the OP pro tag genre, but with city management instead of punching, where some dude just assembles a crack team to do most of the heavy lifting for him. And I will give it this, this one does try to have characters in a plot, but it spends the first half of the season just on him building his support base, and then the second half relies on all of the adults in the world just letting some little kid solve their issue. My main problem was, the parts of the story that were bridged over with narration were the majority of the struggles that took place. Oh, he found some orphan who has absurd possibilities? Cool. The next episode they've realized their potential and are loyal to serve him. Ostensibly, this is an isekai, I guess, but really the fact it is one is superfluous as the main character rarely reflects on his old life and is adapted completely to his new one. So, there's zero point in even having it be an isekai in the first place. Overall, this was a bland experience and I would rather watch pretty much any other isekai out this season over this one, even if the end product was mostly competent. Alright, I want to make this clear right off the bat. I'm specifically speaking about the anime adaptation of Whisper Me a Love Song and not the source material. Seems sort of silly I have to clarify that since these are anime reviews, but I want to make that distinction extra clear because this failed extremely hard on the actual production and adaptation front. Do I have some issues with the plot? Sure, but those are hardly unique to this series and are more endemic of high school romance as a genre. The cast clicking a little too readily without a strong connecting factor, or the countless love polygons and rivals becoming a drag are expected. However, the upbeat protagonists and twists on a very tired Yuri dynamic of a cooler older senpai and bubbly underclassmen by showing the cuter and more mature sides respectively created a depth I appreciated. But what actually killed this was the abysmal adaptation. I said I was surprised by how well the first episode looked in my preview after seeing the studios attached, but by the second, I was already regretting that remark. Because Cloud Hearts and Yokohama Animation Labs generally work under extreme deadlines and abuse their animators. Which really shows in the ugly ass animation here that's better described as a PowerPoint presentation, and the art gets incredibly bad as the series goes on, with awkward models, movements, and snapping into place. So yeah, there were clear corners cut. This isn't even mentioning the delays in episodes. But all of this really stands out in a genre where artistically showing moods is commonplace. This manga got done dirty with a bad adaptation. If you're looking for a Yuri anime, this ain't it. Either go read the manga or rewatch Adachi and Shimamura or bloom into you. If you're surprised the new gate fell right next to its production twinsy this season, it must have been nice living under that rock. Yes, the new gate had the same two studios working on it. And if one was plagued with production issues, it seems pretty damn obvious the other would suffer as well. And it did, minus the delays. The exact same issues with animation I just outlined are back in full force. But unlike Whisper Me a Love Song where I could at least see the beauty underneath, this one was doomed to fail from the start. The light novel it's adapting is already a creatively bankrupt monstrosity, with a plot ripped straight out of Reki Kawahara's first draft from his garbage, and slapping an isekai coat of paint on it to shill it to a new audience. The characters are awful, generic, and lack any defining characteristics. Starting with the lead, who is apparently a legendary blacksmith, former top player who soloed the final boss in an MMO, somehow, and also just has pretty much every power in the verse at his disposal because, why not? Just throw a metric ton of harem baiting waifu characters for the audience to hopefully drool over to distract them from how utterly devoid of plot and character this series is. And that's before I even touch on the already mentioned bad animation. This is an action series that can barely convey movement as it is, and I'm supposed to be invested in these fights? I'm already punching down just by talking about this series, but if you're looking for action, isekai, or 
anything this series offers. Just pick up a rock and throw it. You'll accidentally hit a more interesting version of this one. So that's it. We wrapped up Spring 2024, and it's honestly surprising how many solid shows we got. Even the things I considered average still would have stood out in a less packed season head and shoulders above the pack. But what was great was honestly just so far ahead in a league of its own, it made this season incredibly unforgettable. But tell me your thoughts down below. What shows got you excited this season? I'd love to hear them. For now though, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description if you want. And hey, while you're down there, why don't you check out my Patreon too? There you can pick up some extra perks. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Autumn Stott, Jmon33a, Lalexis, Pokeflute, Robin DBL, Samuel Chen, Sazi, Tristan, and Vonstrom for their continued support. Thanks for watching.